Let them see you in me. Beautiful words. I was in meditation one time and all of a sudden I had this image of a Russian nesting doll. How many of you know what that is? It's those, it's, there's a little teeny doll and then another one and another one and another one. They look the same. And in this time of meditation, all of a sudden I saw myself as that littlest little innermost one. And then there was a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one. And it just kept going until I lost all sense of boundary of who I was and where I ended and where I began. And in that moment, it made sense to me how God could be that and me. And so when we sing, let them see you, let them see the greatest, most part of all that we are in this part that stands before us this day. Isn't that the prayer of your soul? Yeah, I think that's the prayer of each and every one of our souls. So welcome this Sunday, January, we dedicate to what I call back to the basics. It's not the basics in an elementary sense, it's the basics in a foundational sense of looking at some of the ideas that we find in unity, some of the spiritual principles, because January is a time of hopefulness, it's a time of new beginning. Anybody have at least some sort of idea or something new you wanted to start off the new year? Somebody sent me this week, which I thought summed it up pretty well. They said, talking about the new year, they said the doctor told them they needed to start exercising. So they said, I signed up to take an aerobics class for seniors. So I twisted and turned and pushed and pulled and jumped and grunted. And after 20 minutes of trying to put my leotards on, I was exhausted and went home. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. I won't disclose your identity, but... <laughs> So, you know, we often want to change, but we won't change, but we don't want to have to change. Have you ever noticed that? How it's like sort of inconvenient for us to have to change, but yet we, we want to bring about new things. So when we look at spiritual principles and, and ideas, it helps equip us with, with ways of being. In unity, we don't have, there's not a doctrine or a creed or a belief system that you're asked to adopt. As a matter of fact, it's really down to asking you to consider what you do believe and how are your beliefs working for you. And to introduce some tools and some basic ideas that allow us to create the life that I believe we're created to live. And so unity in a nutshell can be described as a positive path for spiritual living. Positive in the sense of life affirming, meaning that it affirms the perfect life that is in you and you and you. The perfect life that is in all creation is the, the positive that we're talking about here. And that it's a path. It's an opportunity for us to be in this exploration together. To be in this place where we're discovering and uncovering and bringing forth the gifts of who we are in a spirit of love and reverence and acceptance. And so there are... In unity, there are five basic principles or ideas. I, you can sum them up by saying, God is, I am, think it, pray it, live it. And we're talking about those here on Sunday and then the class series, which we'll have on Thursday night. We take it deeper, all of these. Last week, just to recap, we talked about the first two. The first two are philosophical. They have to do with the nature of God, the creator, whatever you call God, and the nature of humanity. And then the next three are applicable, they're practices. How do you demonstrate the truth of your being? And so the first two is up to every individual to answer for yourself, what do you believe about the nature of God? What do you believe about the nature of humanity? In unity, what we would, would uh, propose, and I shared many scriptures from different sacred texts from around the world, that there is one, there is one life presence that animates all creation. Call it what you will, but don't let the name you know, get, be the stickler for you. Call it God. I have one friend that calls God, G-O-D, the grand overall designer. You know, um, I have another friend that calls God Howard because their little kid said, God's name is Howard be thy name. <laughs> that, they got that from the Lord's Prayer. So whatever you call the all that is, but just to know that there's all that is. Then, then I like to say that we're all a chip off the original source block which means that we are all created in the likeness and image of the one, just as it says in Genesis, that we're created in the likeness and image of the creator. And in Genesis, it said, and God looked upon creation and God said, it is good. And so there's not an emphasis or a belief in being a sinner and, and in need of a sacrificial atonement. That as a matter of fact, the, the root understanding of the word atonement is really to come into a place of at one -ment. 
and that we're all capable of doing that and so it's just a matter of us awakening to the truth of who we are and showing up accordingly I've said before that I think our world that many people we suffer from a case of mistaken identity and so when we ask ourselves you know that okay that's great if there's God is all there is and then we that we're all expressions of the one how can we show up otherwise how can we show up differently well that's where we're going today because we can think ourselves apart Raymond Charles Barker talked about what I believe the first two principles are he summed it up when he said think of yourself as a spiritual person and cease thinking of yourself as a name or an age or a bank account or a status or a position know that within you is something capable of being greater than you are at this moment begin to think of yourself in larger terms there is a divine intelligence a divine pattern a divine plan a divine immensity in which you are forever immersed and which is forever in action through you and I would go on to say as you one of the analogies the best analogies that I've ever heard of understanding our relationship of who we are in God is to say who is the wave within the ocean that each of us are like a wave in the ocean you look at a wave and the wave is not the whole ocean but all that the wave is is pure ocean and so I'm not saying that I'm all God because God is transcendent God is all things but what we are saying is that we are all waves in this ocean we call God that all that we are that the attributes of the ocean are the attributes of the wave the attributes of God are the attributes of our nature and so it's a matter of us um, waking up to that awareness and so back to that question then well if we're all waves in the ocean and we're all connected and God is love then why isn't there already peace on earth have you ever asked yourself that question <laughs> yeah so I believe and this is my belief but I believe that the response to that would be free will because if we are creators if we have the capacity to create then we must have free will and so that which we call good and evil are really two expressions of one power just like electricity electricity can be used to illuminate this building or to burn it down it is we who are directing the creative power the creative energies of the universe it is we who are directing these for purposes of good or evil and so it's kind of irritating because you can no longer say the devil made me do it <laughs> that there's a, that we have to take responsibility and so while there's no formal doctrine or former creed when you really begin to work with these teachings you really begin to realize wow I am responsible for the quality of my thoughts I'm responsible I can't just blame it on somebody else out there and so today we get to to mind this third one then is is described and called the law of mind action it says human beings are creative by the activity of their thinking our thoughts are creative in nature and our thoughts shape the experience of our reality in unity there's a catchy way to say this and that's thoughts held in mind produce after their kind would you say that with me thoughts held in mind produce after their kind the first time I heard that I loved it it was a real catchy phrase and then when I lived in Hawaii they say that um, where attention goes energy flows the Hawaiian teach that where attention goes energy flows it's the exact same thing thoughts held in mind produce after their kind and so the law of mind action is the movement from mind from this as we say that there's one life of which we are all expressions in which we all live and move and have our being that we draw our life from the very one life just like this one candle draws its flame from light there is light which expresses itself in many different forms there is life which expresses itself in many different forms and there is mind which expresses itself through our individual units of consciousness or our minds and so the movement then goes from mind to idea to manifestation as a matter of fact that is even understood metaphysically as the Trinity the Trinity as we know it is the Father the Son the Holy Spirit so you could say the Creator the mind 
The Son is the offspring, the idea. The Holy Spirit is the activity expressing, the manifestation. So I won't take you too much deeper. Just keep breathing. <laughs> and uh, we'll go into this a little more when we get into the class. But I do want to share with you, Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, said, There is one underlying law. Through this law, all things come into expression. He's talk, talking about the creative law of cause and effect. There's one universal mind, the source and sole origin of all intelligence. First is mind, then mind expresses itself in ideas, and then the ideas themselves become manifest. And so that movement takes place in creation, that movement takes place in each and every one of us. James Allen, who wrote a great book of work called As a Man Thinketh, if you haven't read it, it's a wonderful classic book. He wrote, in the soil of your mind, there exists a garden. And in your life, you bring forth the harvest each and every day. The thoughts and ideas you think are the seeds which create your reality. And your experiences are the fruit of your own imagination. The soil is impartial. It is impersonal. It always says yes. If you plant a tomato seed, the soil does not judge it unworthy and grow a cantaloupe instead. That the soil responds yes. And that's like the creative stuff of the universe that our, our mind impresses upon this pure potentiality and creates through our thoughts. That thoughts, you could call them seed thoughts. Now, you don't just have one thought and immediately it manifests. Thank God, we'd all be in a mess. <laughs> But it's something that has to line up with the laws of nature. And, and you have to really believe it with every particle of your, of your being. Because laws, again, are impartial or impersonal. How many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon? I remember going to the Grand Canyon and I was really struck by a sign. As I was walking to this vast place and you walk up, it's just over... Uh, whelming and, and just so beautiful to see the Grand Canyon but there's signs periodically that say warning the law of gravity is strictly enforced here <laughs> well we know the law of gravity is always working wherever you are whoever you are the law is no respecter of persons the law is going to work the way that it works and so it's a matter of us learning to work with it and so the quality of our thoughts and the quality of our ideas become really, really important. So as we begin to understand that our mind then is a gateway, if you will, to higher ideas. Our mind is a gateway to access information, to learn. You know, we could say that our mind downloads. Have you ever had a sort of a download, just some information that seemed to come out of nowhere? You're like, where did that idea come from? And sometimes it's a good idea. Sometimes it's what I call a teaching idea that we learn from. I remember being in elementary school. And when I was in elementary school, we had those reel-to-reel -reel projectors. And I used to always get excited when the teacher would get that out because we thought, thank God, we don't have to do our normal stuff. We get to watch a film. Anybody else? Can you connect? <laughs> well, I remember one day we watched this film. And it was about how... Um, a hen lays an egg and then the process that the egg goes through the incubation period and then it hatches and you have this little baby chicken, this little baby bitty. And how many days it took and how the temperatures had to be maintained. Well, I was absolutely smitten with that little bitty and I wanted one. And I remembered we had some eggs in the refrigerator. So <laughs> I rushed home from school, went straight to the refrigerator, got an egg, and you know, you know, as a kid, how you kind of rolled stuff up in your shirt? I rolled it up in my shirt, made sure that it was warm, and I just knew I had written down how long I needed to keep it warm. It was a pretty long time, but I thought I could do it. So I'm walking around with this egg, and my mother says, Darlene, where did you get that boiled egg? Oh, it's not boiled. It's a fresh egg. Where did you get that fresh egg? Out of the refrigerator. <laughs> she said, well, honey, that's not a fresh egg. And why do you have it in your shirt? <laughs> and so I explained what I had seen and what I was doing. And she just sort of laughed and said, well, honey, it doesn't work that way. And she explained to me why. And of course, my mother was not as smart as that film or that teacher. And I said, no, mom, you are wrong. If I can keep it warm long enough, I saw it happen. It's going to happen. You don't have to believe me. It'll happen. 
And she said, what I know is you're going to break that egg and you better not make a mess. Well, of course, mom was right because I broke the egg before bedtime. So I wanted to go back and get another one. And she said, you know, no, talk to your teacher. She'll explain it to you. So I did. And my teacher explained to me. And then, of course, I told home, come home and informed my parents what they already knew. But now think about this for a moment. I had an idea as a kid, but it didn't work out. Now, does that mean the universe withheld something from me? Does that mean the universe was punishing me? No. It means that there are laws that work a certain way. It means that within an egg, within a seed idea, that certain conditions must be met. And if those conditions are met, the potential will come forth. The little bitty, it will hatch. But the law, or God... Doesn't, isn't capricious and say, well, I don't like the way you're doing things, so I'm not going to make it work out for you. Oh, I like the way you're doing things. Just keep praying like that. I'll make it work out for you. How often do our spiritual traditions teach us if we can just beg and manipulate enough that we can convince the universe to do something that it's not, that, that's, that's sort of contrary to the laws of nature? So when we begin to look at thought in our mind, First of all, we realize that ideas are meant to bring forth, they're meant to be manifest and expressed. And ideas are also growing us. You see, as a kid, I'm telling you this story many years later because it made an impression on me. I learned something. And, and so every idea, if we can remain open, will teach us something. So the, the mantra this week, the mantra for us to work with this week is... Where did that idea come from? Would you say that with me? Where did that idea come from? Again, have you had an idea that just sort of just popped in your head and you wonder, where did that idea come from? You know, there's inspiration. Ideas come from many different directions. In our mind, typically in our mind, our ideas come from either our subconscious, our conscious mind, or what's called the superconscious. Now, if you, you know what the subconscious mind is, the subconscious means that it's those old reruns that from the day we were born, everything we've ever done, everything that has ever made an impression on us, everything that has ever experienced, uh, we've experienced. Think of it, if you think of it as a computer, it's the memory, it's the storage, it's the programs that are running, all of that stuff we have. And each of us have our own history, our own version, our own way of doing things. Have you ever driven somewhere, sort of a distance, and when you got there, you thought, oh my gosh, I do not even remember going through such and such place. Four of us have, okay. <laughs> I know you all have. That we've, What happens is you just sort of check out that the mind can be both local and non-local. And so the subconscious mind just comes in and, and takes over and does that for you. Well, what most of us don't realize is it's these old patterns, the old behaviors. We make these things, make impressions. They really create us. And so bringing mindfulness about, well, where did that information come from? Is it something old? Is it, is it an old memory? There's a story told about Einstein. Einstein, in his brilliance, was asked to go and to speak at many different places. And as the story is told that, you know, he would give the same presentation to different groups over and over again, and he had the same driver. And one night, Einstein said, you know, I just am tired. I do not have it with me to give that same talk one more time. So the driver, the chauffeur said, I tell you what, we look enough alike. If you, we change clothes, I will go up there and I promise you, I've heard your talk every time you've given it. I can parrot out that same thought. Einstein said, all right, let's go for it. So they changed clothes. The driver messed up his hair like Einstein. And he gets up front and he begins to deliver this incredible presentation, just like Einstein does. And Einstein's in the back and he's very impressed. The guy is, he's really listened. He's from memory. He's parroting this stuff out. Until somebody in the audience raises their hand and they have a question. So he calls on the person and Einstein thinks, what is he doing? And the man stands up and 
the man wants people to know how smart he is, and so he asks this really long question about you know, relativity and anti-relativity and goes on and on, and Einstein's like, oh my God, he's never going to be able to answer that. But the chauffeur just stands up front and listens, and he says, well, that's a good question. It sounds very complex, but I want to demonstrate to you that it's actually very simple. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call on my chauffeur in the back and let him <laughs> answer that for you. <laughs> And I love that story because it's like, you know, our memories, our subconscious thoughts, those old reruns can only take us so far, can only take us so far. And so to realize, to, to begin to bring awareness to, to ask, you know, where did this thought come from? And is it real or is it memorex? Is it real or am I just running this, this old tape? And is it running me? And what direction is this thought taking me in? Is this, is this a quality of thought that I really want to invest in? Because where we get our information is really important. The Oxford University has something that you may be familiar with, maybe not. It's called Oxford Analytica. Every day at about 5.30 a.m., leading scholars from Oxford gather in a room to get reports from around the world on what happened in the last 24 hours. When these leading minds look at this information and it's things, everything from um, crop prices in China, unrest in the Middle East, uh, weather trends, whatever it may be, they, in a few minutes, figure out which one of these do we want to address today. And then they call the world's leading experts on those areas and they put together a response about what has happened in the last 24 hours. And so by 11 a.m. every morning, Oxford releases what's called the Oxford Analytical Report. It's quite pricey, and it's paid for by groups like the CIA, world leaders, major corporations. But the philosophy is that the best leaders make the best decisions when they have the best information. It's a great philosophy. The best leaders make the best decision when they have the best information. Now, I believe that's true. The question is, where are we getting our best information? Because Einstein also said, you cannot solve a problem with the same level of consciousness that created the problem. I think our world is leading us to say, you know what, we've got enough of these rerun thoughts that are, are driving us here. We're bumping into ourselves. This is really not working. Where are you going to get your best information? Well, thank goodness we're not only limited to what's in our subconscious mind. We're also not only limited to the conscious mind. The conscious mind is the part of you, if you go back to the computer analogy, it's the part of you that would be looking at the window and working and making decisions. It's the you that's aware in this room right now. It's the waking activity of your mind, the present part of you. But then there's something called the super conscience or the cosmic conscience. It is from this that all ideas, original ideas, come. It is this place that the master teachers taught us to tap into when they said, ask. Ask, and then let your best ideas come from your higher self from beyond. Seek, seek, put it out there, and then let the answers come from beyond. Knock, and let the answers come. So that requires how to... How to really open to that is what we talk about next week. And I can tell you the preview. It's called prayer and meditation. It's about cultivating mindfulness. Cultivating a quality of mind where you can disentangle the thinker from the thought. Have you been able to know that you are the thinker that have the thoughts, but you're more than your thoughts? And you don't have to get carried away by your thoughts. There's a story of a family who went to um, Disney World. And they had their five-year-old daughter. And um, how many of you have ever been to Disney or some amusement park? If you've been to any amusement park, even some fairs have them. When they have the rides, you know that before you get on a ride, a kid has to go and measure up. They have to be tall enough to get on certain rides. So this little five-year-old girl had spent quite a bit of her time seeing if she was tall enough to ride the rides. 
and she wanted to ride Space Mountain, the big roller coaster. She was on her tippy toes and she was just tall enough and so she rode it, she loved it, they rode it again. So two years later, the family comes back to Disney World. The girl is now seven. They're walking around and she sees this roller coaster again. I remember that, I wanna ride that again. So they go and they get in line and as the line is meandering around, she sees this big warning sign. And she starts to study that sign and read it. And she's squinting her eyes and she's reading it. And she pulls on her dad, Dad, I don't think we should ride this. <laughs> and he said, why? You, we rode it two years ago and you loved it. You're tall enough. She said, yeah, Daddy, but that was before I could read. <laughs> she <laughs> pointed to that sign. She could read now. And he said, oh, well, he said, see all these exit signs? We can exit any time, honey. You don't have to ride. We don't have to ride. And she stood there and went back and forth. And she said, Daddy, how do you make the part of you that thinks you're afraid listen to the part of you that thinks you're not afraid? Isn't that a great insight from a seven-year-old? Richard, would you give me that song? Are you aware that there's a part of you that thinks you can't? There's a part of you that thinks you just are beyond hope. That, that there's a part of you that thinks that you don't have it together and may never get it together. That there's a part of us that may think that, may feel that. But there's also a part of us that wants to go full speed ahead, that wants to bring forth our highest and best potential, that knows we were born to do it. You see, the power of mind is for us to bring awareness to those things. Because what we're each and every one of us here to do is to download. You see, back to the computer analogy, the super conscious mind, conscious mind is sort of like uh, the World Wide Web, how you can access all kinds of information, how one can connect with another. It's how the psychic, the intuitive can pick up on information. As I began to meditate, things happened that I never expected. My intuition opened up. I would be counseling with people and I would all of a sudden have a vision. I will never forget, I was counseling with a woman one time when this first started happening and I saw a toy box, like a child's toy chest. I couldn't even hardly talk with her because that was the image in my mind that just kept coming up. And so I just said, I don't know, you know what this means, but I just see this image of a toy chest and so blah, blah, blah. She looked at me kind of crazy and I thought, yeah, that was crazy. I should not have said that out loud. <laughs> but she went on and the next Sunday when she came back, she was waiting for me in line. And she came up to me and she said, I have to tell you this. She said, when you said toy box, I remembered I had a toy box in my attic. Well, the woman was in my office because she was really struggling because she and her mother had always been like this and her mother had died and they never forgave each other. When I said toy box, she went and got that toy box and got it out and lo and behold, there was a letter in that toy box from her mother to her about forgiveness. When she told me that, I thought, oh my God, where did that idea come from? And I really began to comprehend what it means that we're here to bring forth higher ideas and that our mind is not just you know, for doing these routine things every day. I think it can be summarized beautifully in the, in the scripture. In Philippians 4 and 7, it says, Finally, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Spiritual thinkers have realized the importance of directing the mind to great ideas. And in closing, I want to share with you from Ernest Holmes, who is the founder of religious science, Science of Mind. He wrote in, it's called The Philosophy of Jesus. He said, throughout our lives, we have read and wondered about the miracles of Jesus. But to how many of us has the thought come that the same power must be available to everyone? Jesus had access to a spiritual power that he used in every way. 
To him, it seemed the most natural thing in the world that he should be able to tell the paralyzed man to walk or to multiply the loaves and fishes or to still the wind and the waves. Ernest Holmes said, I happen to be one of those who really believes that Jesus did these things and that we could also do them if we had the know-how. It takes nothing away from Jesus when we say that we also have access to the same power, which enabled him to do such wonderful things. Because when we study his words carefully, we remember that he said, the things that I do, you shall do, and even greater. Jesus had access to some kind of power that was available for every purpose. He had access to an intelligence that guided him in everything he did. And he had a deep inward peace and feeling of security that removed all confusion and doubt and uncertainty in his mind. How many of you want all of that? How many of you believe that we were born with that? It's just a matter of excavating it, of opening and downloading it. Because you see, as we, we, our mind is a gateway to access higher ideas. Our mind is a gateway to download higher ideas. And our mind is a gateway to embody and bring to life these higher ideas. Our goal is to find the key that unlocks the door to the power greater than we are. It's about understanding the relationship that we have with our Creator. It's also realizing that the Divine Presence is wherever we are. And just as Jesus communed with this Presence through prayer and meditation until it was the most real thing to Him, let each and every one of us learn to commune with this higher mind, with this higher state of awareness until it is informing our lives until we are under the influence of it more than anything else. I want to invite you to join me in this song as the rest of our band comes forward as we move into a time of prayer. It says, our thoughts are prayers. Our thoughts are prayers and we are always praying. Our thoughts are physical eyes our awareness is automatically becomes more inward this is what has been referred to as the kingdom within it's the reality of an inward nature thinkers constantly being carried away by thought. It's as if we're sitting on a large boulder in the beautiful sunshine, but this boulder is in the middle of a busy river. And so often we're just caught up in what's moving by, the movements, the waves, the noise, the this, the that. Through mindfulness, we elevate ourselves. And we begin to disentangle our capacity to be aware of the thought from the thought itself. We begin to know ourselves as the thinker who has the thoughts rather than the thoughts that we identify with, that consume us, that carry us away. And so we don't judge thoughts, and we certainly don't try to stop the monkey mind, the mind that swings from one thought to the next, to the next, to the next, because that's the nature of the mind. Through the practice of mindfulness, 
we become more aware of what's happening in our mind. Mindfulness is about knowing what's going on inside of your head without being caught up and carried away by it. And it is a practice. And by bringing one's awareness to your breath, with every breath is an opportunity to let the mind relax and let go of whatever it's holding on to, to detach, to disentangle. And so we speak the word and we join together and we just detach and disentangle from thought. We return to pure awareness, the capacity to be aware, the capacity to witness this movement and activity of thought. We become aware and we know that it happens, that we are just walking along, being guided by, largely by what's unconscious or subconscious. And so we seek to carve out time to intentionally open our mind to divine mind. Create in me a new, as the psalmist said, create in me a clean slate. And so I don't call this positive thinking, I call it possibility thinking. Just be attuned to possibility thinking and to seeing a thought for just what it is. It's just a thought. It's just a belief. And I can download higher thoughts and higher beliefs that are more reflective of my whole nature, that are more congruent with who I am as an expression of all that is. And so every day, may we let go of the thinking and the thoughts. And return to pure awareness. And impress upon me, O oh God. Impress upon me the truth of my being. Inform me and infill me. So in your own way, just use your power of imagination to just let your mind relax and let go. And once again, just to allow your mind to relax and to let go. And now as if you were wiping your hands clean, engage your hands makes it, your body recognizes it at a different level. Just wipe your hands like if you were letting it go. Kind of shaking spider webs off on you. Just let it go. And now open up as if you're this lotus opening up to the sun. I'm here to be present and available to the truth of my being. This week we adopt a practice that just to playfully ask ourselves from time to time, where did that idea come from? Where did that idea come from? Where did that idea come from? And without judgment, just go back to that, move your hands as if you were shaking off a spider web. We're not judging it, we're just detaching from it. Feel the sun opening you to newer ways of knowing and being. And so in this space, we bring into our awareness those who have asked us to hold them in prayer. We know the truth together, that each and every individual is an expression, a unique individual expression of all that is. And so whatever is the prayer, whatever is the need, we ask for the realization of the truth of their being to be manifest. May we hold this for one another. And in the name and the nature of all that is holy, we give thanks, and so it is. 
As you open your eyes, I invite you to stand. And Ellen, if you would go back to the top of that song. Our thoughts are prayers, and we are always praying. Our thoughts are prayers, listen to what you're saying, seek the higher consciousness, a state of peacefulness. Oh,